let me just go ahead and very briefly, to, to save time, introduce Steve Wernke. Um, as probably most of you know, he's Associate Professor at Vanderbilt University. Um, he got his uh, degree at Wisconsin. Yeah, I'm there. Uh, did some uh, postgraduate work at, in North Carolina. And what really distinguishes Steve, I think, is there are two big things. Both of them are kind of complexes by now. Um, the first and most obvious one is he's in the leadership and of a huge movement in historical archaeology, both in the Andes and elsewhere. But if you haven't been affected by seeing your loyal graduate, your, your loyal undergraduates who worked with you in the formative, uh, go off and say, "Well, I'm looking for a graduate program that does historical," and that's just fine. In fact. I was talking about historical here, and I'm in in totally enchanted with it. But it's a groundswell movement. And so you're getting to hear one of the top voices in that movement within the Andes. Then the second one, which is much more complex, and I really won't go into it, is technology, GIS, um, ways of approaching landscape, settlement distribution, um, more localized space. And Steve has certainly been right on the forefront of that and is, is in the leading charge. So we're all expecting these two things to blossom tonight um, and get uh, plenty of historical and plenty of flashing lights. Um, so without further ado, Steve, are you ready to take it away to talk to us about Mount the other form? Thanks for coming all this way, and it's a privilege to have you here on Saturday night. Great, well after all that, I've got the lot sweat before I even started. <laughs> no, uh, Thank you so much, John. Um, and this is a real honor. Thank you so much to the Institute of Indian Studies, to UC Berkeley. Um, and it, it's a real privilege to be able to share my research with you all. A bit uh, daunting, perhaps, um, more than anything, to be the last thing standing between a bunch of archaeologists and free beer. <laughs> so, uh, no, really, I mean, this is, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to share my research with y'all. And what I'm going to present tonight is um, kind of a couple chapters out of a book that I'm working on now, which is kind of uh, summing up about the last five years of research I've been doing um, on the topic of the mass resettlement of indigenous communities in the Andes during the colonial era, uh, what's known as the Reducción General de Indios, no? Um, which is really important because this was really one of the largest forced resettlement programs by any colonial power in world history. Um, now, the Reducción General in Peru draws on um, you know, precedents in Mexico and Central America where this process of resettlement under Spanish colonialism took place more gradually um, largely as a, as, a, as, a, as a mendicant kind of order process. In Peru, what happens is it essentially happens almost overnight, at least in terms of this major pulse of resettlement under the Viceroy Francisco de Toledo, which you heard about in the very last talk uh, by Mark. Um, and it's really an astounding thing that happens. You know, over a thousand gridded towns are built in one decade, in the 1570s, it affects something on the order of a million and a half native Andeans. Um, and we're really just beginning to understand how this happened um, at the micro scale, which is what I'm going to talk about tonight, and at the macro scale, which is another dimension of my research that we're just starting to crack now. We're building a gazetteer called Logar, the length open uh, gazetteer of the Andean region, which is an attempt to 
uh, pull together all the regional experts and build a, a, a base map of where all the upper CMAs are. And right now we're up to 488 that we've been able to map out. And so Logar is actually live online. This is like when the professor says you can actually use your phones and go online and check it out. So logarandes.org, it's live, it's, it's up and working. It's going to be greatly enriched over the next couple of years. Um, but it gives you a sense of the massive extent from, you know, all the way from the border of modern Ecuador down through uh, uh, into Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. Um, and, you know, so what's, what historians and archaeologists and ethno-historians have, have looked at this through a number of lenses through time. In the early 20th century, it was sort of through the lens of looking at Toledo as sort of a celebratory narrative of Toledo bringing civilization to the Andes, the great organizer of the of the vice royalty um, through to uh, the, through the 60s, through the mid century, 60s, 70s, 80s, through narratives of the, how Toledo was an immensely oppressive figure. This was an, an immensely oppressive regime, um, and then uh, narratives of resistance to it. Two more recent frameworks that look at the, the Reducción General as, as deeply compromised. In, uh, and, and, a, and a kind of negotiated outcome, um, especially looking at it from a local perspective. Through all these, a persistent question has been, did the Reducción succeed or did it fail in achieving its goals as a colonial program? Um, and essentially, I'm just sort of saying that's, that's kind of a bad question, <laughs> in a way, and that it's, it's overly simplistic in that, you know, if you just, all you have to do is ask, you know, did it succeed or fail for who, right? Um, Succeed or fail in what sense? I mean, it's, analytically, it's a pretty impoverished way to approach this. And what I'm going to talk about tonight is essentially uh, what would seem to be a clear case of a reducción that did fail, one that was abandoned, um, but that in other ways the, the broader project of reducción lives on. Because reducción is not just reduction in terms of um, congregation of people into these compact towns. Um, as uh, William Hanks talks about in his work in the Yucatec, among the Yucatec Maya and uh, uh, the, the grammars of the men that were written there, they, they, they talk about these grammars, uh, this is something that Bruce Manheim talks about in the Andes with Quechua, through, uh, through these grammars, they call these grammars reductions of language, right? So, reducción is related to this uh, semantic range that, that includes reordering rationalizing, reorienting, and convincing, right? Sort of converting would be the better translation here, I think. So over there you see the arte del idioma maya reducido a sucintas reglas, right? So the reducción general in Peru is a kind of culmination of what I'll approach this as a kind of semiotic ideology in what keen sense of you know, uh, what constitutes a sign and how do they work in the world. Here it's, it's sort of, um, the, the assumption here is that urban form equals civic community. It's not just a precondition to civic community, it actually produces civic community. Um, that urban form is a kind of divine order in place in nature. So, understanding how that universalizing kind of vision was actually implemented and in that process transformed in particular places, of course, requires sustained analysis of particular reducciones. So that's what we're going to be doing today, tonight. Um, and so to, to place us here, we're in the South Central Andes where I work in the Colca Valley, which is west of Lake Titicaca. Um, the Colca Valley is this major drainage running down here. Um, so semi-arid western slopes of the Andes, about 3,000 to 4,000 meters in the valley itself in, in elevation, um, home to the Coyaguas and Gabanas ethnic groups. These are major ethnic polities on the order of 50 to 70,000 people on the eve of the invasion. Um, and uh, the Coyaguas were Aymara speakers <coughs> living in the central and upper part of the valley. The Cabanas were the Quechua speakers living in the lower part of the valley. So then within that, um, uh, yeah, the Coyaguas were divided between La Coyaguas, lower ranking subgroup, and Yankee Coyaguas, a higher ranking uh, group within the Coyaguas. So um, just to briefly give you an idea of what the, you know, 
most of us, you know, obviously worked probably in the communities that you work are probably rigid tsunamis, but just to give you a sense of what they look like, I'll, I'll briefly take us out the valley and sample uh, uh, what these rigid tsunamis look like. This is kind of on a cone day in the lower part of the valley where uh, Marion Dutro did, uh, did her uh, excellent dissertation work. Um, and uh, and uh, you get a sense of the scale here. It's on the, the alluvial plain above the deep and sized canyon in this part of the valley. This is in the lower Quechua zone, uh, prime maize agricultural uh, zone. Now we're moving up valley a little bit to the town of Madrigal, a small low reduction in um, La Icoyaguas. Um, also, excellent maize production zone. All these towns are these gridded towns. Most of them are divided between Anan Saya and Udin Saya, divided. So the grids themselves are, 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 are divided spatially and socially, um, usually right now in the dead center of the village. Here's the major town of Ladi, the capital of Ladi Coyaguas, which is situated right on top of a major, as uh, Mary Dutro documented, on top of a major. Um, Inca administrative center um, in the central part of the valley, right in the breadbasket of the Colca. Moving up valley to Yanque is the capital of Yanque Coyaguas. Again, on top of the primary administrative center um, for Yanque Coyaguas and therefore probably of the um, valley itself. I surveyed in Yanque and the neighboring town of Coborake across the river um, way back when in the late 90s. Uh, longer ago than I care to admit. Oops, what they just do. No. Oh, no! So, Kukurake, and here we're moving now into the upper part of the valley, on up to the town of Tuti, which is where we're going to be tonight. Um, and we're going in tonight. We're going really to a, a, a micro-scale view of life in a reduction. So the modern town of Tuti is down on, the, on that uh, first alluvial plain above the river, the Colca River, which runs down through here. Um, the old town, the original town of Santa Cruz de Tuti is just upslope, it's about four kilometers upslope. So this is what, uh, what Santa Cruz de Tuti looks like um, today. Um, and what I want to do is just first rewind a little bit, just very briefly, to talk about the predecessors to the Reducciones, it's just a couple slides here. Um, so before the Tulane Reducciones, it's not just this event where people are resettled. Um, it's, it's, it's a process that's punctuated. Um, in the 1540s, the Franciscans come to the Colca Valley. This is one of the earliest points of intervention of the Franciscans in the southern Andes, south central Andes. And the Franciscans build a series of chapels at existing Inca settlements. And they slowly transform these settlements by congregating people in them. And we see this at the, at the site of, of Malata, where I worked in 2006 to 2008. So this little UAV um, video we shot this past summer, kind of revisiting the site. Here we're moving up through the, 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 the lower part of the site, which we believe are these linearly arranged houses. We excavated several of these, which we think are the houses that were added at the eastern extreme of the site. Now moving into the central core of the site, which is the older part of the site, the old Inca part of the site, um, with probably the house of the Curaca right here, and it kind of administrative building, a plaza, and here's your chapel, and its little atrium here, and Inca Cayanta structure, and its plaza out here. We see this repeating pattern of Inca plazas and these great hall structures, and their close association with uh, these early chapels and their plazas, and with this idea of the sort of transferability of the use of plazas and, and the centrality of processionals in both Inca and Spanish um, um, ideas of a properly ordered um, sort of civic community, if you will. So then what happens is people from probably the neighboring <coughs> uh, Inca era site of Alquimarca, which my student, a uh, recent PhD, uh, Lauren Povet, excavated, is Late rise only, no evidence for colonial occupation. They probably were resettled to Nolaten. Probably some of those families at the extreme of the site were resettled there. Then these people from Nolaten are resettled. That, that, that uh, occupation is truncated by the Reducción General. Um, Santa Cruz de Tuti is founded, but I think that the people from Nolaten at this local scale are actually 
resettled to a different reducción that's the nearest one on this side of the river called, it's listed as La Villa Nueva de Alcaldete de Coimo, okay? And it appears in the original listings of the reducciones, but it does not appear in the 1591 visita, which is the first visita after the Toledo visita. And so sometime between 1573-ish, when the reducción actually happens, and 1591, it disappears. And I think what happens is then um, Coimo, for whatever reason, I don't really understand why, but it is, those people are resettled up to the already extant um, Santa Cruz de Tuti. Okay, so now we'll go up to Santa Cruz de Tuti. So there's Coimo again, modern Tuti in Mount Chuyacta, what's today known as Mount Chuyacta, Mount Cayacta, Mount Chuyacta variants. And it looks like this, it's very, very, um, it's a spectacular setting in this um, sort of basin, high altitude basin, it's up at 4,100 meters, um, really well preserved, very extensive, it's about um, 40 hectares in total extent. Um, it's kind of a ten, it's the, you know, typical gridded town, reduction town. I actually saw this particular image way back when I was just starting my dissertation work, and I thought, where is that site? And I went to the Muse, uh, American Museum of Natural History and looked at the sequence of photos, and I could more or less um, reconstruct the flight path of the Shippey Johnson expedition, this part of the valley, and then I paired it up with some old, some of some weird, I think Pat mentioned um, um, the importance of these old Ministry of um, Agriculture maps. I looked at these old hand-drawn Ministry of Agriculture maps and was able to pretty much isolate where this uh, was. And I walked up there in 2004, and of course the people of modern Tutti see this as their ancestral town. So it was no news to them, but it sure was news to me. Um, so it, it, was, it's, um, it still looks like this today, as you'll see. Um, very clearly laid out on, on the cordel, is, which is mentioned often in, in descriptions of the reducciones. A very standardized um, um, size of, of these blocks. Um, several of the blocks are outlined but then are vacant. You'll see here in the middle there's a big, what this is, is a big pofedal. This is basically a marsh. So they, they gridded it out but they didn't really build on it in most cases. Some of this has been taken down by um, recent people, um, you know, doing Kirka and stuff like that, but for the most part, this is blank, and we think that that was used essentially as a corral. This is high altitude, Puna, <clears throat> pastoralism country, right? Uh, not nearly enough uh, pasturage for all their animals, but probably was used as a corral in the center of the site, okay? Um, so it's big, 507 buildings. It's on top of a major Inca center, like several of the other reducciones as we saw. And it was abandoned in 1843, which we know uh, from local uh, parish documents. And so, relatively recently, I mean, it runs all, all so you essentially have the entire um, colonial sequence into the early Republican era. So, at this one site, we have a really good case study, almost, as, almost like a laboratory for understanding the effects of the built environment in a reducción. So what we're going to do is sort of ring as much as we can out. So this is another video of a UAV flying through the through the arched entry into the site. The very scary people out there <laughs> and coming up over uh, the ridge, and you're presented with the site through the arched entry and the gridded um, the gridded uh, neighborhoods blocks. This is probably the Buraka's house that we actually excavated this past summer. Um, here's the major church, the main church. There are 14 chapels at the site. Um, this is the parish alongside the church. You're getting a sense of scale um, uh, with um, some of our ongoing excavations in the parish. We excavate all, all of these um, uh, rooms here, which is the sacristy, the rectory, um, and a storeroom probably after that. I'm not going to talk about our excavations. We're not quite ready on that. But... Um, um, a sense of the scale of the site here in terms of, and, and a sense of the, the architectural preservation of the site. Um, the, there's the church, um, there are some of our, our operations there, and then we also excavated in um, domestic context that this is that uh, probable um, house of one of the Curacas. We know that there, are, there were nine Curacas in the, in the colonial era as uh, reported in, in, in visitas, as I'll talk about. Um, 
and, um, and uh, a variation in the way that, that uh, domestic compounds are laid out. This Budaka's house, he has the entire block to himself. In other cases, um, we have irregular layouts of, of, the, of the blocks. Um, in other cases, they're divided into four. Um, and so there's a lot of variability. It appears that, that the construction of the site was more or less a process by which the, the administrator said, okay, you, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna, tirarlo uh, al cordel, we're gonna lay out the grid, and sort of, you guys build your houses the way you build your houses, okay? Be, uh, just by the, the, the variance that we see in the domestic organization. So, um, you know, on top of the really good um, architectural preservation, we have really excellent um, documentary record for the site. Um, and so, using those documents, we can think about the heuristics of, of how to uh, reconstruct the, act, the, the sociology of the people that were resettled to the town and sort of reconstruct the resettlement process um, in more detail. So if you think about this is located in the Puna, poorly located for agriculture. Um, so we would expect the original inhabitants would have been pastoralists in their economic focus. Um, we would expect then that in the visitas, in the censuses, that do include landholding and, and um, livestock declarations that the originary peoples, the descendants of the originary inhabitants, would be primarily pastoralists in their agriculture or in their um, in their economic focus, right? So we should see that in their declarations. So this is a folio out of uh, one of the visitas, the 1604 visita. So the visitas here were, as in many places, recorded by moiety. So you had separate visita runs for Udin Saya and Anan Saya. So in this case, we have complete census data from 1617 and 1604. 1617 for Anan Saya, the upper ranking moiety. 1604 from the lower ranking Udin Saya and moiety. So they're really close together. We can almost treat it as sort of synchronic data. Um, and so what we have is really detailed information out of this. These are visitas that run into the over a thousand folios. Um, so the Households in them are grouped by Ayu first. So here's like a town, here's Koborake, and then it says Ayu Koyana there, and then here's Tributario One, he happens to be the, the Kuraka, and his wife, his children, and his agricultural um, holdings that are located by Topanem, and then they also list their livestock. Okay? So it goes through house by house, goes through Ayu by Ayu, and then within each Ayu, house by house. Now in the case of Tuti, what do we see? We see a uh, total population in the 1604-1617 window of around 1,000 people, 1,015 people total, right? But two-thirds of them are from Anansaya. It's not split down the middle demographically. <coughs> two-thirds of them are from Anansaya. And so looking within these moieties, the, 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 these are the named IUs, or sort of, these are sort of lineage scale IUs within the moieties, okay? And so what we see is two IUs that are that are marked as the the, uh, the, the top-ranking IUs, the ranking IUs of each moiety. In other words, the Kuraka of this IU, Pahana uh, Paloka, uh, as Kuraka of, Anans, uh, of as the ranking Kuraka of Anansai, is the ranking Kuraka of the entire village. And the, the Kuraka of Taiki Pataka is the ranking um, Kuraka of Udin Sai. So if you look at those two, what's interesting here in the demographics is Pahana Kaloka, the, the top ranking IU, is almost half the population. Okay? Um, so that's that's saying something right there, obviously. It's about 41% 40, I think of, of the population is from a single IU, right? Um, now Taiki Pataka is not notable demographically, but as we'll see, it pairs with Pahana Kaloka and the economic dimension. So I think that these two are the most likely candidates for the originary for being descendants of the originary IUs of the town. So now if we look at the livestock declarations, he's looking at this scale, um, Pahana Kaloka, the ranking IU, has the most livestock per capita, the most pastoralist in focus, right? So this matches our heuristic for this being the descendants of, of the, the um, original inhabitants. And Taiki Patak has the second most, oops, has the second most um, livestock per capita. This is on a per capita basis, okay? So now we look at um, 
agricultural holdings, the other IUs, which are much smaller, are kind of agriculturalist IUs that are small in, in a demographic scale, but focused more on agriculture, more, more um, land per capita, um, generally speaking. So we're looking at a scenario in which we have the reduction is, is, is situated where the ranking pastoralist IUs lived at this former Inca administrative center, and then these fragments of, or, or segments of agricultural societies, mostly from the lower ranking main side of Moedi, are relocated from down below up to this reducción. So that's a bit on the sort of uh, social composition of the reducción and where they came from, perhaps. Now we can look inside of the settlement. So what we did is, to, to map the complexity of this architecture, we flew it with um, UAVs and balloons. We tried all kinds of stuff and we iterated on this. We eventually got really nice coverage with UAVs and we have like a five centimeter resolution map of the, of the whole site and ortho mosaics and DEMs and so forth, which we then traced and digitized in the field on screen while we filled out um, attribute forms on them, taking all kinds of notes on every element of every building and that's sort of our base map, okay? So this is sort of now our, our base map that we're gonna use for subsequent analysis. We did um, surface collections. We did uh, at least a 10% area collection within each of the compounds, within each, within each of the blocks using dog leashes. Um, and uh, so we had uh, 913 dog leash collections where we stake people out and they collect every single ceramic fragment on the ground. And then we also collected from all the building interiors, so that's 507 buildings. So then we get density measures out of the dog leash and building interiors, and we can interpolate those into surfaces. And so this is the ceramic um, density um, surface for Inga era ceramics, okay? So hot, quick hotspot analysis shows us that we have clear, you know, clear concentrations on the south side of the site here, major area of of concentration of late horizon ceramics here, and then some, an, an anomalous uh, big concentration up there on the north side of the site as well. Okay, so those two spots. And then moving into the early colonial era, um, our diagnostics are showing a more generalized distribution. If I showed you the late colonial stuff, it would become more generalized still, but I won't belabor that point. Okay, so looking at this now, um, so we've got these two concentrations on either side of the center of the site. But if we look at the center of the reducción, um, you know, this is, it's, it's a curious thing because, you know, the site seems to follow a gridiron pattern, a checkerboard pattern. You would assume that the center of the site would be where it would be most regular, right? It's the monumental kind of part of the site. But actually, this is where it least conforms to an ideal grid. And this is where it gets especially interesting because as you'll see, it's, it's actually composed of two plazas, this plaza here and this one here, and this plaza is trapezoidal. Hello. So this is our, <laughs> in, we're almost positive that this is our Inca plaza. Um, Will McCollum did a, a great honors thesis on the distribution of Inca stone masonry, which we only find in Inca centers in the valley, um, and they're only found in the church and in the parish and across the way over here in this strange area that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're calling a kind of maybe a waka or maybe a platform Ushnu kind of feature. And so it may very well be that we have a kind of Ushnu or platform, let's just call it, and then the plaza itself from the old Inca site, and then probably a concha-like complex just following the norms of Inca site layout sorts of ideas. So in other words, the, the, the reducción, even though it seems to be this blunt imposition on the landscape, is actually oriented and built around the former center of the Inca site itself, right? So now we have these, uh, the parish inventory that actually describes the, the layout of the town um, and names of streets. It's pretty stunning. So this is from the parish inventory of 1790, and it says um, that it's sort of oriented around the Casa de los Curas, okay? So there's our parish, and it says, which Elinda por la frente con la Plaza Real. Okay, so there's the Plaza Real. The Inca Plaza is the, the Royal Plaza. Um, and and, and, and it, it, is, it is intersected by the Calle Real, the Royal Street, um, which runs from west to, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, from, from, uh, from east to 
west, from Oriente a Poniente. And from behind the Casa de los, los Puras, another calle real, which runs north-south. Um, and then it says the, 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 uh, the parish has, has nine piezas, nine rooms, and it does have nine rooms, trust me. Um, and then at one point it says there are two fountains. There are two, like, constantly kind of, like, wells. It's pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and, um, and then in another part it says, oh, and there's this Plaza Vela off to the side of the church, which is actually really amazing in, in that it has, and it says that there are six um, capillas around that plaza that are already in ruins in 1790, okay? So six capillas around the Plaza Vela with its central atrial cross here, okay? Um, so, so this, so if we put this data together, we have the primary axis of division of the Calle Real, which bisects the Plaza Real, a secondary axis of another Calle Real. We have the ceramic distributions, which shows us that the, there's a major uh, length horizon occupation on this side of the site. And I could go into the architectural stuff, but there's a lot of evidence for this, where the early houses are at the site as well. Um, and thinking about what I was talking about earlier, it's very likely that this is Anansaya with that IU of, of descendants of the original population that was almost half of the population of the site, primarily pastoralist, and that this is Udin Saya that's primarily descendants of the displaced IUs of agriculturalists. So we have the, the, an agro-pastoralist town that is really composed of, on the one hand, pastoralists, and on the other hand, agriculturalists that are living cheek by jowl, right? Um, and so, so setting that aside for a moment, now let's think about um, dwelling in this space, living in this space. So the idea, of course, of the Reducción was that by building it, um, they will become, as I put it, sort of proper Christian civilized subjects, right? As Toledo is sort of, he's sort of like the Trump of the colonial world. If you build it, they, they will come, right? build it and they will become proper citizens. The idea that the built environment will produce civic community, right? But of course, you know, pulling on work like Thomas Spearn's work, uh, what buildings do, right? Buildings don't just sit there imposing themselves. They are forever objects of reinterpretation, narration, representation. We deconstruct buildings materially and semiotically all the time. So yes, they stabilize the relations, they channel movement, they make certain behaviors repeat and persist. They afford and include certain visual experiences. They're built and rebuilt, but they are built, and they are rebuilt, and they're remodeled and repurposed and reinterpreted re and demolished. Right, so it's all that. If we know anything from sort of practice theory, <laughs> um, you know, uh, the relationship between structure and agency as it relates to architecture is not so simple as Toledo would have, right? So, but that said, buildings, as Garen says, don't only impose themselves, but they certainly do impose themselves, as we know. We can't just make up how we relate in this room any way we want. Right? So the starting question in, in looking at that relationship is, how did the built environment of the reduction of structure, movement, and visual experience sort of in its brute factuality, in its materiality itself? So how do you get at that? So one way that I've thought of doing this is through a network analysis in which you send walkers out from every building to every other building, and then you combine that with a view shed analysis, analysis which is weighted by the density of the traffic from the everywhere to everywhere routing, and you get a sense of movement and visual experience in the town combined, right? So, you know, what we're trying to do is we're not trying to just be, you know, so sort of if we take the, the phenomenological approach to its extreme, you know, you either privilege the archaeologist and kind of, you know, say, uh, trust me, I'll tell you what the experience was, or you, or you attempt to be a kind of ventriloquist dummy for past agents. That's not what we're trying to do here, but we are trying to get at a kind of um, aggregate sense of, and a probabilistic sense of movement and visual experience. So to do that, then we took the DEM from the digital elevation model that we produced from the UAV overflights, and we stripped out the architecture as best we could because we want the buildings to be at their original heights. A lot of them, we have the full height, 
some of them we don't. So um, we, we um, for the ones that we don't have the full height, we estimated based on the averages of the widths that we do have the full height for. So anyway, okay, so to build the network, we have the streets, we have the wall dividers within the, within the blocks. So um, we digitized a, a network through the site. So we have uh, 473 house doorways that are the origins of this network and 507 destinations. Um, and then the model runs a least cost path analysis through the network, which is taking into account not just the shortest distance, but the, the shortest time and walking time, taking into account slope, uh, the slope factor, and also preferentially routing along the main roads. In other words, you're not going to have hundreds of people cutting through people's blocks. So we have turn rules built into the model as well. So it's quite a complex model that I had a lot of help from Abel Traslavinia in the digitization process and Lauren Kohut in the model scripting itself. So kudos to those guys for their work. So, so essentially what we're doing, so this is from one house to the other to other houses. Right, so let's call that house one. So the model then repeats that for house two, repeats it for house three, and you got an everywhere to everywhere matrix. Right, so you have a 473 house uh, um, origin by 507 destination matrix, which is 239,338 routes. And then, so, so we're not just sending one person from each house, we're sending a number of walkers out that is proportional to the roofed area of each house. That makes sense, right? So we don't want to just send one one person out from a big house and one person out from a small house. We want to send out a proportional number of people from each from the different size sizes of the houses. Um, and so what we did is we used Narrell's constant of six meters squared per person, and uh, and we um, and we did it that way. So and then so you end up with all these routes that are stacked on top of each other, and then you just sum them, and you have than a, 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 a heat map of movement through the site. So that's what this is. Okay, so this is all those 239,000 routes. This is the, 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 the everywhere, everywhere traffic density through the site. Now remember, this, they're not going anywhere. They're going everywhere. They're not going to the plaza, but it looks like they are. And that's what's really interesting here is it's not like a counterintuitive result, but it's showing us that sort of the plaza here is really hot, the, the Inca Plaza. The other plaza also, um, but uh, the Calles Reales are, are points of, of convergence here, um, and there's a hot area down here, which we think is probably the original entrance into um, the Inca era site down there. Okay, so that's our network um, density through the site, our traffic density through, this, through the site, excuse me. Um, so now we can combine that with visual experience. So the question here is, what features are prominent in aggregate while walking through the town, right? And conversely, what features are less common or difficult to see? So here, you know, we, here's what we did. We took the, the architecture footprints, we extruded them to their heights, to their, what we think are their, and in most cases we have the full height. In the cases that we don't, we take the average heights of the cases that we, based on the cases that we do. Um, looks kind of like that, we get a little bit closer, and then we rasterize that and turn it all into a DEM that if you were to zoom in there, you'd see the buildings are directly extruded on the, on the, on the terrain, okay? So then we send out um, observers through the network. So we want to generate a cumulative view shed weighted by the traffic density from the everywhere to everywhere routing. So we evenly distribute a thousand observer points, more or less the population of the town. Um, through the network, and then we extract the traffic values from um, the network, right? So the routing traffic, right? You're going to get a lot of uh, people observing here and not very many people observing here, right? And then we run a view shed analysis from each of those thousand points, right? And in a traditional view shed, you get zeros and ones, not visible, but visible, right? So white here is visible, black is not visible from a given observer point. But then what we're doing here is we're weighting each view shed point by the, by the corresponding traffic that passed through that point in the network in the everywhere and everywhere um, traffic um, simulation, if that makes sense, okay? So we ran this twice, once without any um, observer radius restrictions and once with a 50 meter observer radius, so that people can't see more than 50 meters, just to give us a better sense of like what's 
more visible in the proximate visual range. With the, <coughs> if it's unlimited, you're getting a very general sense of what's visible, and they're all equally weighted. So I'm not going to focus on this here. I did run it that way. I'm going to focus more on this here, on the 50 meter um, radius version, because that's more interesting in thinking about architectural prominence at the near scale of this. So this is the result of that, okay? So this is the cumulative view shed that's weighted by the traffic density. Okay, so again, I mean, our Inca trapezoidal plaza is the hottest spot in the site. The Plazuela is pretty warm, too. The, the big corral or the bofedal out here is also quite warm. A big area of prominence because of all the traffic running through here. Um, and then our, our original um, entrance into the site is, um, is very, very hot, too. Um, so, but that's kind of a, a jumble of data. It's kind of hard to interpret. So we can actually extract um, values using a point, um, uh, uh, a point grid. And so we have 2,000 odd points that we uh, interpolated those values to and run a, a hotspot analysis on those points. And here we see a statistical treatment of this where we see statistically significant hotspots of visibility in the corral, in the plaza trapezoidal, in the tra trapezoid plaza, into the, um, in, in the entrance in the plazuela also, right? Okay, so now how about looking just at buildings? We can mask the buildings, um, and so we end up with a, um, a, uh, a visibility raster that looks like that. Those are the visibility values of just the buildings leaving out the landscape, okay? And then we can take the highest values of the rasters within the polygons, um, and uh, run, a, run a, an analysis of that. We see, you know, the church is, seems to be uh, very high visibility, the parish, the, the, the chapels out in the Plazuela, basically the center of the site. We can run a, a hotspot analysis on that and find that, yes, there's a significant hotspot in the center of the site. Again, this is not a necessarily, um, you know, counterintuitive result, but it's showing us that um, uh, the brute sort of factuality of the, of the way that this reduction was constructed is encouraging certain kinds of movement, right? Another way we could run this is by running a random view shed in which you distribute a thousand observers randomly in the network and then give them all the same uh, values uh, of one, right? So it's unweighted and you end up with a totally different kind of distribution, right? So this is random observers on the network, um, each observer equals one, and then comparing that to our, our model, um, and then you can put them, you can normalize the data so they're on the same scale, zero to, uh, it's on a scale from negative one to one, and subtract one from the other, and you get a difference raster, right? And so that's what this is, where red spots are where our walking model with the traffic density um, is significantly higher, and the blue areas is where you have um, the unweighted um, random um, observers have significantly higher values because, uh, and so we're seeing how um, in, this, in this core area of the site, um, the church, the chapels, and the plazas are visually ubiquitous, right? Um, so we're seeing, in a sense, the imposition of the built environment, how it was constructed to channel certain kinds of movement, um, certain kinds of visual experience and interaction site in this region. Um, in other words, the plazas and the churches are kind of unavoidable without going out of your way. You literally have to go out of your way and, and at least cost sense to avoid the visual sort of promiscuity of these buildings and these spaces, right? Um, but it wasn't just an imposition either, right? Because, of course, they're recycling the Inca Plaza, what we think of is this, the plaza, uh, I'm sorry, the platform and the concha, and turning them into um, um, the central spaces of ritual for uh, Catholic evangelization, right? So this is a kind of double, doubly colonizing, colonizing space in that sense, where new patterns of practice and sensory experience and surveillance are masked onto and overriding these Incaic precedents, okay? Um, so, the built environment is doing work here. Um, Toledo's project is doing work here, but we brought P 
people with different economic activities and interests together in this town, and I think that um, that's the story of decline and abandonment, right? So we have half of the population roughly composed of the ranking pastoralist IUs, right? In other words, the Reducción was built where the ranking IUs were, that was a political decision. They were the pastoralists living up here in the high altitude. Um, the other half is composed of these small IUs displaced from the agricultural zone below. Now the problem here is pastoralists need to move around, of course. Especially alpaca pastoralists, which is what predominates here. Alpacas preferentially, bed findings work on this is excellent. Pa um, alpacas preferentially uh, 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 eat the, the succulents and the grasses of the bofidales. Very quickly can be overgrazed, so they need to rotate their pastures and they need to move around with their flocks. Agriculturalists, of course, can be a little bit more sedentary, but they were more radically displaced by, by, by the resettlement. So we have a kind of long-term political ecological incompatibility here. So if we jump forward all the way to 1785, when we have the next um, series of demographic data, we see that the population, this is from the, the parish census, the Padron de Feligreses, the population declined to 437 people. Um, and we see a different distribution. Now, Ananzai is only 40%, where before they were two-thirds of the population. Remember, pastoralists. Uyinsaya is now 60% of the population. <coughs> so, um, in other words, we have a 57% overall demographic decline from 1604-1617 um, to 1785. And, um, the um, Anan Sayaboy has gone from two thirds to 40%, and, and, uh, and Udin Sai has um, increased in its share. So, what's going on here? Do we, you know, if we look at our three demographic, fundamental demographic variables, do we have a decrease in fertility? Do we have a high mortality rate through time? Obviously, that's likely as well. Do we have migration? Um, now, do we have a decrease in fertility? The mean household size in 1785 with the Padron. Is only four members, you know, so two adults, two children, roughly. It's not really replacement level, let alone recovery level. So low fertility seems to be an issue. In part. Um, we have high mortality. Um, this is the demographic curve uh, from Noble David Cook, who did a very detailed study of the Coca Valley. Um, and in the mid 18th century, when the population is at nadir, basically. It should be rebounding around this time. Um, we were not seeing that in the replacement, in replacement level fertility in Tutti, but um, certainly demographic decline in terms of mortality seems to be a factor here, right? But it's not just that, because of this difference between Anansai and Udin Saya. Anansai decreases by 62%, and Udin Saya only decreases by 21%. So there are major differences, the major, there are major differences of fertility and mortality between the two are, are highly unlikely, I think. Which suggests that out-migration among Anansaya is the more likely um, possibility here. Right? And so what we see is, in that same padron, 30% of the population is listed as not living in the village anymore. And of those 30%, um, most of them are Anansaya. So, um, so you have essentially almost half of way of 40% of Anansaya households living off-site now, out of the Rukus, and they've left. They're coming back to be registered in the parish, but they don't live there anymore, and they, they say they live in such and such a stancia that's named. And then uh, in Udin Sai, it's about, uh, I guess it's about 25%, right? So we have a higher, um, higher rate of absenteeism among Anansaya, the pastoralists, essentially which I think is an indi indirect indicator of abandonment among Anansai households more generally. So we were able to locate these through the help of one of our dear friends in, in Tuti, um, Joseph Kuspe, Amaniu, we've worked with for many years. And he said it was like almost embarrassingly easy. We, we showed him the names of these um, estancias, and he said, oh yeah, I know what that is, I know what that is, I know what that is. And then Abel Trasavinia uh, went out, and well, he went out and we digitized on the screen where they are. So luckily we were able to locate 79% um, of where these estancias are. So these are the purple sort of house figures here, are the Anansaya estancias, and the orange ones are Udinsaya, okay? 
Okay, so we were able to locate 79% of them, which is 198 people of the 400 uh, people that were left in the uh, uh, registered in the town. Uh, 12 from Ansaya, 7 from Ansaya, 5 we couldn't locate. Yeah, maybe we'll get them later. So what we see in, the, in terms of distances, these are not minor distances. Um, Ansaya, um, Estancias are further away as a group, and these are statistically significant results where we have, you know, as far as 50 kilometers away, 51 kilometers away, um, with a mid-spread of, you know, we're talking uh, 8 to roughly 20 kilometers in a straight line from Namchigata, from the original Reducción of Tuti, where Woody and Saez tend to be much closer and they tend to be lower down. Um, there are bufedales um, in the sort of agricultural zone down below where the Anansaya estancias tend to be up really high. So we're seeing, I think, a kind of return to the estancias from which they came uh, among Anansaya and Udinsaya pastoralists. Now we can model this in terms of walking time using Tobler's walking model that uh, Nico, is Nico, Nico Tricks, did you hear Nico? Did the, the, uh, the, that, that uh, table that everybody knows and loves to, to, to model um, movement over over three-dimensional terrain, and we see that um, um, you know we have walking times and one one-way travel of upwards of you know 10, 12 hours out to these estancias. These are not trivial distances, um, and we see differences again between onside being higher walking times versus mean side. So greater you know so they're out there ranging with their camelids with their alpacas. Um, having abandoned the reduction, which now for them is essentially a ceremonial center, I think. They're going there for Catholic rituals, they're probably bringing their bodas to be blessed and so forth during certain prescribed times of the ritual calendar and so forth. Um, and um, so this is just a view of some of the closer estancias. Um, I'm highlighting four of these and we'll sort of do a fly through. Um, to show you the kinds of distances involved, involved from the reducción here out to four of the actually closer ones where you're traversing several drainages. Um, so this is the, the Estancia de Mar Marcarani, which is actually kind of more over here. This, this is the Bofedal. There are ruins. There are currently occupied buildings at these estancias. It would not surprise me at all if the people living in these estancias in some cases are direct descendants of the peoples that are registered in these um, padrones. It would be a really interesting follow-up study. Here's another Bofedal. Here you can see the the Morales and the buildings out there at that uh, estancia, zooming back down to the Reducción, um, and now um, uh, zooming out to the third one, and so and so forth. These are these are really difficult treks. So they were not coming back here often to the Reducción. I mean, uh, it's not a daily occurrence. They were they were living out there in the estancias, <coughs> coming back. Um, periodically um, to the Reducción. So by the late 18th century then, the Reducción has turned into, as far as the pastoralists are concerned, a kind of vacant ceremonial center. Um, we know from parish correspondence that um, the parish itself was merged and placed under the authority of the neighboring town of Cibayo in the 1790s. So we're seeing evidence of decline and a loss of uh, parish members to put, put under the jurisdiction of Sibaya, which is a little further up valley. Um, so all of all the documents are actually in, in under Sibaya in, in the archives today. Um, we see uh, uh, descriptions of the church and the chapels falling into disrepair at this time. Um, the church is said to be apuntales, it's like propped up in places. Um, we see that in our excavations, evidence of that in the, in, the, in, the, in the parish itself. Complaints of spreading disease from corpses, um, malo, ma, malos aires in the bofedal, um, and the bishop eventually uh, orders the abandonment of the town in the 1840s. We actually have the, the contract to build a new church, um, um, and uh, they built that new church in like six months. It's pretty incredible. They founded it in 1843, okay? So this brought to mind, sort of the, the, the title of the talk was inspired by this great ethnography by Sarah Lou Scar, an ethnography that doesn't get as much attention, I think, as it should to get very good distribution in the U.S., 
is an ethnography of displacement um, of the modern town of Matapukio, um, in which members of the community are spending time in coffee plantations in the eastern slope, and some are going to Lima. She talks about here how the people that go to Lima and take on the, the ethos of civilization in Lima um, reflect back on their, on their community and say, and she says, at almost every meeting of the community organization in Lima during this time, some of the discussion would revolve around a vision of Matapukio as a centralized town. The, uh, the Central, which is the community organization, their members envisioned a new ground plan more appropriate to Matapukio's elevated status of comunidad campesina. This layout was patterned on Toledo's colonial reducción, which, through their enthusiastic discussions, seemed to represent a shared sense of what was deemed appropriate to comunidad status. So in other words, they abandoned uh, Santa Cruz de Tuti, and they built another reducción, right? Um, which is the modern town of, of Tuti. Um, so, you know, talking about this, it solely in terms of domination or success or failure of a reducción, I think, doesn't take us far enough. Yes, in the physical sense, you know, I go, the reducción, of course, was onerous. It did entail a, a radical dislocation. It wasn't that, that uh, dislocation was not evenly uh, shared, obviously. Um, but it wasn't an arbitrary dislocation. This was a political process by which the, the primary uh, political agents of the area won out, uh, not to the benefit of the agriculturalists. So, so it was a kind of forced marriage of distinct community segments of pastoralists and agriculturalist families. Um, by the late 18th century, it became a significant center for pastoralist families, while agriculturalists were sort of stranded up there. And what they, so then they moved down slope, down to the agricultural zone. So you have a failure of the physical reduction, but the reduction as an idea, right, as, a, as an organizing principle, as a semiotic ideology endured as, the abandonment, as they abandoned one reduction to build another, such that this foreign form of reduction becomes a kind of means by which to make a claim to um, autonomy. So I will leave it there. Thank you. Analysis, your visual analysis of um, the main site there, the Santa Cruz de, de Tute. To what extent uh, are your results um, influenced by the kind of the, the visual obstructions of domestic space that we saw in your, your various graphs in contrast to the visual prominence of church and plaza, those open spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at one glance you might say, well, isn't that just, that's, you know, the inverse saying the same thing opposite. But I'm thinking, you know, of course, in, in other uh, uh, architectural and settlement settings where, um, you know, plazas could be of highly restricted access, but in your analysis, it would show up as being visually prominent simply because, or because it could be seen from, the space could be seen in an unobstructed way from residential areas. In that latter case, though, in this model, because there would be low traffic, because it's, visual, because it's restricted access, those values would actually be low. Okay. So what, what we're, what, the way I used to run this sort of thing, this took, you know, some puzzling, is I used to just put people in doorways and run a viewshed. And of course, you know, the viewshed runs 360. I, I could run it as a kind of cone of vision, too. But it runs 360, and of course, you're blocking everything behind you, you know, because the building's right there, you're in the doorway. So I wanted to get people out into 
the settlement. So I thought, how can I combine network analysis with this? So that, how can I then get a, an idea of proportionality? Where is the traffic? So, again, it's everywhere to everywhere. I'm not routing people. I will route people in future iterations. Like, we know that, of course, they were calling, they would ring the bell when they'd come to the plaza. And most of the action was out in that atrium, out in that plaza. And I had, I had to cut stuff, but there, I mean, there are actually four bosas in that plaza trapezoidal. Bosas are these, um, um, they're, they're platforms that are not in the corners of the trapezoid, but they form a rectangle among them. And so what they did is they did processionals to the four bosas. We see this throughout the Americas from California all the way. In all the mendicant, not all the mendicant, but it's a common feature in mendicant complexes where by processionals would proceed and, and um, you would pause at the posas, which is from the Latin posa, and they would pause and, and encant the four Christological events from uh, glorification to incarnation, uh, crucifixion, resurrection, and then a final prayer in the center. So we actually know in detail, you know, what they were doing in these spaces. Jeronimo de Ore was in the valley. He wrote uh, pretty much the standard um, catechism that was used in the Council of Lima later. Uh, but anyway, so that on a bit of a tangent there, but but the idea was to get people out into this into the space in the most likely ways that they would use the space, like. I used to run a model where we didn't have any restrictions in the, in the network and you know, we had all this traffic running through people's courtyards and things that, so we thought, okay, we need to put term restrictions in so that people only use the main streets until they get to the block that they're going to to then enter the, <coughs> the compound to go to the house. And so, we, and so um, the, the network traffic is routed in a particular way. So, that we think is the most likely way that the space is actually used, and you end up with these traffic densities, and the visibility analysis then is built on top of that traffic density model. So sorry, long ended, but that yeah. yeah. Donna, I think you barely beat Patricia. Okay, so this is a very similar question, but um, all your view shed analysis and network analysis is based on people walking through the site, uh -huh. but I'm really curious about I don't know if you want this information. Could people see the church from their house compounds? So if you're standing in your house compound doing your daily activities, if they rang the bell or did whatever, yeah. you look up and see the church. Yeah, or yeah. would it be instructed? That would be a really cool follow-up. Yeah, no, I mean that that's the sort of thing. That's the way I used to kind of run it, that I would just run one per house. Now what I would do is take and I, you know, proportional value to the size of the house. Set the person out there on the patio, at each patio, and just do a view shot and see. But yeah, I mean, if I, I mean, if you just go out there and look at the site, if you're just standing out there, that church is kind of unavoidable. Now, why do you go through all the trouble of even doing any of this, right? If that's the case, right? Well, I mean, again, we go back to reductio ad phenomenology. Trust me, you know. No, I mean, we need, uh, what, what this does allows us to run different scenarios, it's reproducible, it allows us to, um, to uh, see how this, how the, the built environment in aggregate, beyond any particular experience, but in aggregate, how it, it probably functions to structure people's visual perception and movement. Yeah, yeah. I know you're doing it in aggregate, but I was thinking, uh, do you see any sense that as the grid was developed, that the position of the next block and the next house was determined by the position of the one before it. So that, you know, houses had to be over here at one point, mm -hmm. the next block had to be over there. Right. I think that the grid was all laid out in one house here. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we have, this, it's so regular, they only vary. Uh, by a, a couple meters, there are 40 to 43 meters, and there, 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 there are lots of empty blocks that are in the middle of the sort towards the middle of the site. Um, and it's the variability within the blocks that I think is showing us that, that on the one hand you have a grid layout 
that's very regular despite all the topography there. There's, there's one major band of a uh, of rocky uh, kind of colluvial slope that they literally couldn't build over. And so the grid gets interrupted sort of diagonal, but it, it, it keeps the grid jumping over it, essentially. It's sort of like um, Peaky Yak there, in that sense. Kind of incredible, the, the insistence on that grid. But then here's this trapezoidal plaza that breaks the flow of the streets and everything and so forth. So, um, so yeah, I do think that the grid was, was um, one, one else. Um, you know, you just said Piki Yaku, which is going through my mind. <laughs> um, when we look at Piki Yaku or, or the scholars who have worked there, they're constantly saying, well, this wasn't finished, and so Wari must not have been successful, must not have really administrated uh, successfully. Uh, and yet, your reducción is Thank you. 